we are a little bit sooner due to finance and corporate community services meeting being ahead of schedule <laughs> thanks to our chair but uh, we will move on to the consent items dealing with the naming of two community parks um, Councillor Callumway Sealock I don't have a question I just um, have a comment okay do you care to move it oh yeah I do okay Go ahead and make your comment. Okay. I just wanted to ask staff if they can pass this report on to the public school board just because they're currently looking for um, a name of their school and this parcel is adjacent, so I just think it's information they should have. So just asking for that to be forwarded along. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Um, since we are ahead of our schedule, we will move to item number five, dealing with uh, neighborhood matching grants revisions. And uh, let me just see, Mr. Joseph and Mr. Croft will be here to answer any questions. So, doesn't seem to be anyone answering questions, want to ask any questions. So, oh, Councillor Marsh. I just have two questions regarding page 5-4. The first one is just wondering, um, you know, I, I, I know that this neighborhood matching grant uh, is committed to responding to applications as soon as possible and that it's not, there's no uh, deadline per se, but I'm just wondering if that has been clarified on our website and in any materials that to promote the grant. Through the chair, um, we can definitely add that clarification to the website uh, related to that time frame, um, and we'll emphasize as well that there is no set deadline for the neighborhood matching grant. But typically, to get all the ducks in a row and figure out what needs to get done for a project, around four to six weeks. Wonderful, thank you. And then the second question is for you as well. Is just, I'm just wondering if you can help us understand how you plan to define a neighborhood group, uh, so two down from that point, the second last point on 5-4 is just that you're, you're planning to uh, only receive uh, one uh, application from a neighborhood group per year, calendar year, and, but sometimes we have groups that are uh, different yet within the same geographical bound, boundary. So through the chair, to clarify that, what we mean by new group, it could mean like a group of five neighbors that want to do something in the neighborhood. So um, by all means, there can be multiple groups within one neighborhood. So that wouldn't be the case. It's just more we want to avoid the same group the same group of people coming forward over and over again. We want to kind of level the playing field, just make sure other new groups who have a creative idea are able to access some of those funds. Wonderful. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, are you clicking in to, for comment? Okay. Councillor Fernandez. Yeah, so as I'm looking at the, the graph on page 5-2, what I'm understanding now is that so far in 2017, September, we have handed out $58,755 worth of grants. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Okay. There, there are a couple um, groups that are in the process of still tweaking the applications. There's still a bit of work to be done on some of those, but yeah, those funds have been allocated for projects uh, where the funds have been requested. Okay, and our total budget was 65000 right? 60000 60, sorry, we're pretty close. Okay. Are we, I mean, I think the intention was to make sure that the grant money was spread out pretty equally as much as possible throughout the city. Are we, have we seen that? There's pretty good ward representation of groups that have come forward for grants. So it says here in the report about eight wards have been represented. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a big focus of the work that Love My Head's doing is to try and, you know, spread the grants and the projects throughout the city. Um, we are finding with the larger grants, the ones up to $15,000, uh, 
more organized groups are coming forward that maybe have done this before, have experience. Um, and I've always said to those groups, you know, thanks for taking the lead because, you know, once you do it and we learn, right, hopefully it becomes easier to spread these projects in other parts of the cities. But sometimes you need to start, you know, with a, with a group that's ready to go, see how it goes, and then, you know, take the lessons learned so that we can share it throughout all neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's good that we've got a good example of all the different projects that have been funded. How are we pushing this out? Because I think a lot of it is social media. A lot of people are finding out about this through social media. Or, you know, they've got a friend who lives in um, a neighborhood that has done something. Let's just take the Wilson um, traffic calming paint. That, that, that was an, an interesting initiative. A lot of people are saying they want to do that, but they don't get organized enough. How can we help people get more organized? For sure. Um, through the chair, I think, you know, we have to give a lot of credit to our neighborhood liaisons. Um, they're doing amazing work on the ground, talking with people, helping them through the work that Love My Hood is putting out there. You know, we can make it as easy as we can. Um, sometimes some groups are going to struggle, though. And so having that staff support there, meeting with people, um, you know, Lauren Ross, our, our neighborhood liaison for the Wilson Traffic Calming Project, did some amazing work, you know, meeting with the school, meeting with the students, a lot of back and forth dialogue. So I think that human element to the work that we're doing helps. Um, and just making sure that those, you know, neighborhood liaisons are out there, building awareness, um, you know, taking the report or the social media posts and making it real for people. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. Um, Sarah is, is the one in our area, and, I, and she's really trying so hard to get those people to be cohesive and collaborative and, and move forward on something dis, despite some naysayers. You know, you've got to sort of put the naysayers, give them a, a feeling of, of comfort that this is a positive approach and that we're going to move forward on something exciting for the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, the $15,000... Sorry. The $15,000 that we're talking about here... Um, I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So this, so we've just increased our large grant to fifteen thousand, or is this a one-time fifteen thousand dollar grant? I, I was a little bit confused as I was reading through this. So we basically tripled the amount that a group could request. Okay. So in the past it was five thousand maximum. So okay. now they they can ask for up to fifteen thousand for a project. And how are we going to monitor? The because that's that's quite a large. I mean, five thousand is is a significant amount and and can do some really good things. But fifteen thousand, I mean, we're, we could be talking about some physical structures now. So like a shade structure. For sure. How are we going to monitor how that is uh, maintained? Um, does it require operation staff to be part of that process? Can you give us a bit more detail? Sure. Uh, so through the chair, um, that's. Partly sort of why we're going this approach of agreements. Um, the reason that stemmed that was because we realized, okay, now we're tripling the grant funding available. And, and we've also found through our experience that groups are matching it, right? It is a matching grant. So projects could be upwards of over $30,000. Um, and so the purpose of the agreement is just to lay out clearly a roadmap, who does what, um, what needs to get done to make this project a reality, and not only a reality, but then once it's in, how do we make sure it has longevity, it's cared for, um, so the agreement's really just, you know, laying out the expectations, the roles and responsibilities um, of everyone involved, city staff, uh, residents, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's not dis that much dissimilar to when community groups took over a cul-de-sac, right? Once mm -hmm. they took over a cul-de-sac, we stepped back, and, and they were to continue um, uh, the good work that they had originally started. Okay. Um, is there any more? Anybody else? Okay, I'll come back. Thanks. Mayor Verbanovic. Thank you. Are you at comments now, or so, if you want to make your comments, so question, now, you can go ahead. Sure. Okay. Just very quickly, uh, I certainly uh, am uh, very supportive of uh, of this. I want to thank staff for the the work that's been done. Um, I think the uh, the program has has worked well. We've had a lot of uptake and interest from uh, from various community groups um, in terms of. Uh, some of the uh, the initiatives. I've had an opportunity to uh, to attend some of the initiatives uh, as well, which has been uh, which has been great to see 
community groups um, coming together and and uh, getting involved in, in their neighborhoods as as, uh, as effectively as as they are. I'm also pleased that uh, you know that staff are looking at making some uh, some adjustments. Uh, I mean, no program when it's initially launched will be will be perfect, and uh, clearly we got some input from from our own experiences and from um, community members around some things that that perhaps could be changed, and uh, those changes are being reflected in the motion that's before us. So I will be supporting it, and uh, hopefully others will as well. Thank you. Mayor Verbanovic, did you say you're put, moving this motion forward? No, that was the consent item. Oh, it was Councillor Marsh. Okay, sorry. I don't know what it is with this system. I'm starting to not be able to hear both sides well now. It just seems muffled. Okay. But anyways, uh, Councillor Etherington. You can do both if you want, if you have five, if it's within five minutes. <laughs> Yes, that's correct. The shelter in the park. Yeah. Question related to that, not a serious one, because I really like what I see happening. Uh, but one question I had, if a neighborhood group or a group goes ahead with one of these <coughs> projects, as with the one in Cherry Park, if they see an item a material item that perhaps the city could loan them or give them for the, as they build that project. In this case, it was fencing, I believe, safety fencing. Can they come back to the city and ask if they can borrow that kind of equipment, or is that not kosher? So through the chair, I think it's important to emphasize that the Neighborhood Matching Grant provides a mix of funds and or in-kind support. So lending of a fence to a resident group, you know, who's working on a project, I think is, you know, reasonable and we might uh, be able to do that. Um, but I would count that as sort of an in-kind support. So um, not in addition to the 15,000, but maybe, you know, let's say it costs a couple hundred bucks, you know, then that would be included as part of the in-kind support that the city provides. I think in the case with Cherry Park, just the timing uh, was a bit off. And as I've said to Shirley many times, you know, thanks <laughs> for taking the lead. Uh, we're learning as we go through this process. And uh, again, once we do a debrief on Cherry Park, I think we'll be in a better position to understand, okay, what, what is involved with a shelter like that? Because I think the total value is definitely over 30,000. So it's a new thing for staff. It's a new thing for residents. Um, and you know that, that comment around in-kind and fencing, I think would do us well for the future uh, projects that we're gonna do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Schneider, are you okay? Well, um, Councillor Fernandez, you want to do questions? Yep. Okay, I'll let you go first with your questions, and then I'll get you, Dave. Okay. So we talked earlier about social media being one of the ways, and and our our um, neighborhood liaisons. Are there other ways that we can promote the the partnerships? I know we including partnerships with businesses, or is it just partnerships with residents? Well, uh, through the chair, I think what we've been finding through some of these projects is that the residents are pursuing these partnerships, which is exciting. I think it makes sense that they kind of go that way. Um, they're getting donations, they're talking to different companies, this uh, person donated some picnic tables. So I think that kind of stuff is really good. I think that's the kind of thing that we're hoping to encourage with this resident-led stuff is be proactive, find people in your neighborhood that support the, the ideas you want to do and you know maybe find some business partners as well. Yeah, no, I, th I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Joseph, because I think if the residents are approaching businesses, that builds another level of community um, involvement. Because you know, if there's a business in the community that already that hasn't ever been involved, to see that now they there's a bit more ownership and respect is built between the business owners and the residents. Because sometimes they may not like that business at, at some point in time when they start these partnerships. That could build a good bridge. Right. Okay. Um, I certainly think that. The, the, uh, I'm going to make my comments now, that as we move through the neighborhood grants and the community garden grants and our placemaking, 
we're learning more and more how to do this uh, in, in a good, solid manner so that we have ownership and we have buy-in, that it isn't just a one-shot deal and that it's done and people walk away with, from it or they move out of the area and nobody wants to follow through. And I think that's really, really important because you know, once the paint dries or once the shelter is built or once the cul-de-sac is done, if there's nobody to follow through, it all, it all just falls apart, really. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that it's good that some of the changes that we have um, are going to, to put that into place, I hope. Mm -hmm. But it is a definitely a, a big, huge learning curve for yeah. everybody. So thanks very much for the work that has been Thank done you. here. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Ioannidis. Uh, I'm really happy to see this. One of the questions you get asked as a councillor sometimes is, what's, what's the best part of being a councillor? And for me, the answer I, I, I share the most is our neighborhood strategy. And I'm just so impressed with the engagement that went into creating it, all the information that was gathered before shaping it. It was amazing. We, we truly listened to our citizens. And, and this, again, is, is further response to what they've said. Uh, we are making this easy for them uh, to be citizen-led and city-supported. And uh, as Councillor Fernandez said, as, as we progress, we, we learn more and, and we keep reacting to uh, make this easy. And uh, I, I think this is going to uh, really, you know, help the enthusiasm for this grow when people find out and the word gets out, like how easy it was to deal with the city and how supportive and excited they were about our ideas. So uh, again, this is just like further excellent work on listening to our citizens and responding in, in a very positive way. So thank you for that. Okay, thank you. We have no further questions or comments, and it's been moved by Councilor Marsh. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Um, take one minute here to figure out what, who, what our next item is. Clerk's checking out. Yeah. Okay, we will deal with discussion item number two breaking the silence on hidden violence and we do don't have a presentation or no we don't have a presentation but we do have a delegation and that is Ms. Juanita Metzger from the Waterloo Region Crime Prevention Council. Um, welcome Juanita you have five minutes. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you Chair Ioannidis and the uh, Community and Infrastructure Services Committee for your time this afternoon. My name is Juanita Metzger and I'm a Community Engagement Coordinator with the Waterloo Region Crime Prevention Council. Breaking the Silence on Hidden Violence was published by the Crime Prevention Council in 2015, um, but this is not our work alone. Uh, this is the work of the community and we've made it a commitment of ours to be a champion of it continuing. Our role at WRCP is to do with, not for, and that's why you'll see some supporters of Breaking the Silence in the room this afternoon. They might arrive at three. <laughs> we all want to live in a safe community, and it's our right to do so, but sadly, safety is not a reality for everyone. For some people, because of their race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, ability, religion, they are at heightened risk of oppression, persecution, and violence. Hate crime is a reality in Waterloo Region. As with all crimes, our community is able to track the total number of hate crimes as reported by police. This is only one measure uh, that we have to track this, but it, does, it tells only part of the story not all of it. We also know that not all kinds of uh, incident, or we know also know that uh, these kinds of incidents, hate crimes and hate incidents, are underreported by as much as one third. 
As an update to this chart that you see in front of you, um, stats for subsequent years are as follows. In 2013, there were 14 police reported hate crimes. In the year 2014, there were 28. And in 2015, there were 51. From Stats Canada data, we also know that hate crimes perpetrated on the basis of sexual orientation is a smaller overall occurrence number than those based on religion. However, two-thirds of hate crimes that are based on sexual orientation tend to be more violent, usually in, usually in uh, forms of assault. And this is even higher for trans individuals. That's the backdrop against which the Crime Prevention Council opened a space for community dialogue in 2014 and the report that you see uh, before you in your package. Among the many roles that a municipally based Crime Prevention Council like the WRCPC plays is to listen to and amplify the voices of those who speak out against marginalization, violence and oppression. <laughs> So why is this important to a municipality like ours? All municipalities can play a role in addressing hate crime. Municipal leadership, through application of its values and outward support for vulnerable communities, can make a statement about human dignity, social change, and inclusion. Municipalities can be a strong advocate for positive social change through policies, funding and resources, Statements such as flying the rainbow flag during Pride Month, partnering with community groups and organizations, and ensuring municipal public places are welcoming and inclusive. Our goal, as outlined in the report, the staff report that you received, is to ask for your endorsement of breaking the silence on hidden violence. If you're able to do so, you are adding to and supporting the work that is already underway by individuals and volunteer-led groups and organizations. Beyond your endorsement, we encourage you to review the calls to action in the report, specifically pages 8 and 9, which identifies how you as an ally or a champion can inform systems level, community level, and individual change. Community and systems level work requires groups and municipalities to work together. Your support and leadership as elected members in the City of Kitchener ensure that we continue to work together to realize positive change. Um, lastly, I'd be happy to share a few of the items uh, that have uh, taken place since the, the report was issued, if you're interested. Do you want to share some of the items? Go I can, if you have time. Sure. Okay. Um, so, first of all, the Breaking the Silence report has been widely distributed uh, locally, uh, provincially and nationally. Um, and the report has also been endorsed by the Region of Waterloo and the City of Waterloo through presentation before each of their councils. A community, a community working group formed in September 2015 to continue the work that began at a community forum. And uh, that working group is now a subcommittee of the Rainbow Community Council. And based on this report and the recommendations, the working group has a mandate uh, for three th focused in three areas, safe spaces, the role of allies and champions, and safety with police, safety and reporting with police. Um, this working group is hosting an event on Wednesday, November 2nd to share findings about the Outlook study, which is a, a significant study of the rainbow and LGBTQ community population in Waterloo Region. Um, and that event on Wednesday, the 22nd, will be an opportunity to use an arts-based inquiry into what spaces people feel are safe in our community and how we can work to create more of them. Um, lastly, uh, city staff, Kitchener City staff have also joined the Rainbow Community Council and are supporting uh, the work of the Breaking the Silence Working Group as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. We do have some questions for you. Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair. And I, just, I actually don't have a question, but at the appropriate time, I would be honored to uh, move this. I, I do want to thank you, uh, everyone you worked with, everyone that you reached out to, who you uh, got information from, and uh, brought this report together because uh, I think as a city uh, we do need to 
to say that yes, we embrace inclusivity. So thank you for all the work and everyone that was involved in any way in this report. Thank you. Thank you. The Safe and Healthy Community Advisory Committee has also been instrumental in supporting this work as well, and they've made it a part of their work plan and to focus some of their efforts on um, uh, a few work items really uh, supporting the LGBTQ community. Council Marsh and I are on that committee, and I think this is something that we've seen and heard the discussions, and it's very near and dear to both our hearts, so thank you. Councillor Marsh. Yeah, I, just to echo Councillor Schneider's comments, thank you for bringing this forward. It's very crucial, and I think uh, one of the things that we can do as allies and champions is, uh, is, is right here in this report that we can share share these recommendations, share the document more widely, and uh, make sure that uh, the more people that know about the importance of uh, making sure our whole community is safe for everyone, uh, the, the, the safer it'll be. And uh, uh, so, so I, I'm very happy to wholeheartedly uh, endorse this report. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez. Thanks, Juanita, for the, um, the presentation about this report. And, and in a way, it's kind of sad that it took us a while for you to get here, because we probably should have started this much, much sooner. The numbers are, are pretty distressing when you see them. I mean, they've gone down um, a little bit. But I heard, and I, I could be wrong, but I've heard that a community that is not afraid to report hate crimes and, and, and incidents of, of hate is also a community that is also uh, is very aware of what needs to be done. Do you see that at all in your studies? I, I mean, people who are silent often don't want to do anything, but people who are speaking out and, and, and um, making comments are ones who do want to do something. Yeah, there are municipalities uh, reporting in the Stats Canada uh, in Stats Canada reports on hate crimes that record zero hate crimes, which is uh, probably highly unlikely. Um, so yes, a community that um, there can be two two things that it might indicate. Might, one might indicate that yes, there is a higher presence of hate crimes and hate incidents. Um, but it also, also can indicate that a community is very active and vocal in encouraging people to report hate crime. Um, because people often won't unless they're supported by their community or supported by um, members of a peer group who will help to support them in, in reporting and the process afterwards as well. Uh, we've had several very good efforts in our community. Um, that have promoted rep reporting. Um, in 2009-2010, there was a project funded through the Safer and Vital Communities Grant called Preventing Hate Crime, and it was peer-to-peer -peer training of uh, hate crime prevention. And uh, the Coalition of Muslim Women has also been quite active in um, educating members within their community on how to report hate crime and supporting people who wanted to do that as a result of an incident that they've experienced. Um, police have also done a, a good campaign recently um, called Hate is Learned, and it's also an effort to remind us that we can unlearn that, and when we do encounter it, that there are, um, effort, or there are avenues to report that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I mean, all of those groups that you mentioned, I think it's so important that they, they send the messages out, right? I mean, I know that Focus for Ethnic Women have had numerous uh, events to encourage people to come and, and, and learn about um, Muslim women and, and, and to learn about the, the way, their way of life, but also to dispel all the myths and, and the negativity surrounding around, um, women, women who are of Muslim faith. Is there other um, things that we can, I mean, having a report is really important and, and, and um, showcasing it here at council is, is important and becoming, supporting uh, your group is important. But are there other things that, I mean, I, I guess on an individual level on 213, you, you talk about all the different things that we can do as individuals to reduce hate crimes in our community. Do you see people sort of 
picking up the cause and saying, you know, outside of the groups that you mentioned? Um, actually, um, the Crime Prevention Council hosted a series of porch chats this summer at the, the governor's house on Queen Street. And one of the porch chats was on citizen intervention and bystander training. And that was an effort to give people a range of skills that they could use to uh, recognize a, an incident of harassment or violence or um, low-level microaggressions and to be able to start to develop some skills to use to respond to that. Um, everything from intervening with a comment to uh, reporting or, or calling 911. Uh, and, and that porch chat had about almost 30 people there and every person around the circle indicated that they learned something new and uh, also indicated that they felt it was worthwhile to have a wider community uh, forum or training of, of that sort. Um, they felt it was valuable. Oh, that's, that's positive news in, in a world where we're hearing far too often about um, even political figures, you know, right next door to our country, where where, where that negativity and that that um, that hate is just perpetuated. So you guys are fighting a very challenging tide, and I'm glad to see that at least we're making a little bit of headway. When you hear that 30 people came for a porch chat, that's very very encouraging. So thank you for the time that you guys are doing to um, to dispel that and to to make us feel like we live in a safer community. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Davey. Thank you, Chair Anitis. Uh, thanks, Juanita, for your coming in and your presentation. Uh, I just had one question, a bit of a follow-up to Councillor Fernandez in terms of the chart that's here and the numbers that you gave us for uh, 2013 to 2015. Uh, I was a little disheartened to see that those numbers are, are trending back up, but I was wondering if I could perhaps get your insight because you're much closer than this uh, than, than I am, certainly. Um, is this, is the numbers trending back up, is that in your sense, is that indicative of um, the situation is getting worse, or is it potentially partially that people feel more uh, safe to actually come follow, come up and report these these incidences? Uh, it can be an indication of both, and it's hard to know exactly. Um, but anecdotally, uh, there have been a, a rise uh, in 2015 and 2016. There has been a rise in hate crimes reported against. Uh, visible m minorities on the basis of religion. Okay, that does help. And just, uh, I won't comment very long. I just would, I would offer my unqualified support in endorsing this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Etherington. Welcome, uh, Juanita. Could I ask one quick question and then make a comment? Uh, what happened in 2009 with this? extremely high figure locally. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that figure? Um, Waterloo Regional Police could explain it better, um, but in my understanding, while we were developing the hate crime prevention project, um, Waterloo Regional Police changed the way they recorded certain okay. incidents. So incidents that previously had been recorded as an assault or graffiti were simply recorded and reported as an assault or graffiti and weren't uh, reported as hate crimes. And so they made an effort to more accurately categorize the incidents that they were reporting. I understand. Thank you. And my comment, uh, I wanted to thank everyone associated with this report. It goes without saying that, of course, we should accept and support. It's an excellent report, just as we should raise awareness and address any issue of this kind that has such a destructive impact or can have on uh, any marginalized group in our community. As a council, we should uh, certainly help break that silence that has had such a negative, hateful impact against members of our LGBTQ community. And it certainly has my support, and I hope the support of council. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Verbanovic. 
Thank you, and uh, Juanita, I just wanted to uh, thank you as well for uh, the great work uh, that you've uh, done on this. It's, it's very important work, um, particularly at a, at a time when, as, as has been noted by uh, my colleague, Councillor Fernandez, it, it seems um, comments made by public officials south of the border and, and, and certainly uh, um, replicated in, in media on, on this side of the border have almost made um, unacceptable behavior permissible in, in a way or, 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 or in some people's minds it's, it's made, made it uh, permissible. And I think more important than ever for us to, uh, to tackle um, some of these issues both through the work that, uh, that's being done here uh, and the work that I know Councillor March and Councillor Schneider and the rest of the committee are doing at our safe, uh, um, safe and Healthy Community uh, Advisory Committee. Um, I, I do want to just comment a little further on um, a question that was, that was raised around um, numbers, and it, it was something that when I had heard it previously, I, I did raise, raise with uh, local um, enforcement officials, and, um, and the, the response was similar. Um, uh, part of it is they first and foremost need to feel comfortable um, with the, the local enforcement community to come forward and be able to uh, report it. Um, and that does exist in our community. And so whether we're talking about hate crimes because of LGBTQ issues or issues of, of, uh, of uh, race and, and, and other things, um, the community is, is, um, is comfortable reporting these issues. Um, and, and feel, feel supported. And then that second level of support is, uh, follows that, uh, that, uh, that reporting and making sure that the supports are back, in, are in the, are in the, uh, in the background there to, uh, to support them afterwards. And I know, uh, the work that, uh, you do through the Crime Prevention Council and, and the many partner agencies really helps, uh, ensure that. So, so thank you for that. Thank you for bringing this, uh, forward. And I, I certainly will be uh, supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have no other further questions from other members, but I do have a few questions. Um, I guess in regards to other communities, how, how does Waterloo Region compare to other communities with regards to you know, police reported hate crimes? Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the numbers from 2015 are the most recent stats that we get. Um, and unfortunately, Waterloo Region, or Kitchener Waterloo, was within the top five. Um, and again, it's, a, it's a, a tough statistics game to play um, because it can be, that can be a good indicator that people are actually reporting and that our uh, police, uh, our, our Waterloo Regional Police, uh, sees, uh, makes a strong effort to make sure that it's accurately recorded. Um, compared to communities of similar size that record zero hate crimes, um, it's an easy, um, it's an easy, uh, it's an easy stat to skew. Um, so it, it, it can be a, a good thing to say that our community has strong relationships so that people are able to report this. On the other hand, uh, absolutely, we wish it was zero. A real zero. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. that that's a really good explanation. Um, I guess I will finish off with my comments. I think uh, any hate crime to me is unacceptable, <coughs> and especially in our community. I never want to see any of that happen in our community, and, and any work or any uh, projects or anything like that to facilitate that love wins is something that I can totally support and be behind. So with that, it's been moved by Councillor Schneider. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you so much. Thank you. I guess our next item will be dealing with community garden program item number three. And we have uh, Ms. Yvonne Westerfield to uh, Cardosa to give us a, a five minute pre PowerPoint presentation.
Okay, good afternoon. Thank you. I'm here today to speak to you about the community garden program update. Firstly, I'd just like to say that getting to this point involved a lot of hard work from a project team of individuals from various divisions in INS and community services who reached even further into other internal business groups as part of their research, their information gathering, as well as the execution of some of the documents before you. We could not have gotten this far as we have without their hard work. I'd also like to thank the Community Garden Council of Waterloo Region for their assistant, assistance and the members of the public who participated in our survey and our focus groups. Okay, I'll just briefly go over the items that we'll touch upon in this presentation. We're going to look at the history and context, community interest, Community Garden Council of Waterloo Region, the step-by-step -step guide for community gardens, community garden grant, and moving forward. So currently there are 15 community gardens of various forms on city land with over 240 plots. And there's another 20 community gardens on city land, so those would be places like, sorry, on non-city land. So those would be places like school, faith communities, housing cooperatives, etc. And due to community response, we are working to increase those numbers. So there's been a strong and steady interest in community gardens. Through Love My Hood neighborhood strategy consultation, community gardens were the most frequently noted by residents as a way to improve a place and connect people. As the city continues to intensify, and particularly with high-density housing developments, we anticipate that the demand for opportunities to grow one's own food will continue as well. The Community Garden Council of Waterloo Region is an umbrella group of action-oriented volunteers involved in the Community Garden Network, whose mission is to promote and assist with sustainability of community gardens throughout Waterloo Region. The Council operates with a staff and in-kind support from the Region of Waterloo and in collaboration with community organizations helping to bridge the needs of individual community gardeners with their partners and sponsors. The group has been very helpful to the project team and throughout the community garden update. And in addition to being a valuable resource and supporting to support to existing gardeners, they have committed to continue to work with city staff moving forward in the implementation of new gardens. You'll find the community garden step-by-step -step guide in the appendix B of your package. Similar to other resident-led initiatives, a step-by-step -step guide has been prepared to provide residents with an overview of the process required to start a new community garden. But it will also guide them along the way. And as always, staff will be available to work with them and provide additional support if it's needed. Currently, the Community Garden Grant is located in Section 5 of Policy I-525 in Community Investment. While it provides opportunity for one-time cash and in-kind support for the establishment of community gardens, it includes unnecessary information and also requires alignment to both the updated Community Garden Program and Love My Hood. So we have prepared an updated Community Garden Grant, which can be found in Appendix A of your package. Based on current funding, this grant will support one to three new gardens per year on city-owned land. The grant also provides financial support for establishing gardens on lands not owned by the city, which could accelerate the garden program expansion. 
Consistent with community feedback, staff recommends that resources be directed toward one to three gardens per year to ensure success rather than spread, spreading resources too thinly among many new gardens, which could then fall into disrepair or face multiple challenges. Staff is proposing that this new grant process for new and expanded community gardens begin on June 1st, 2018, with approvals provided for 2019 garden installation. So moving forward, well actually currently we're just putting the finishing touches on our newest community garden located at the Stanley Park Community Centre. And moving forward, um, we also, uh, the following three community garden initiatives are currently in various stages of consideration and planning. There's a new community garden at Henry Sturm Greenway that's been proposed as part of the Iron Horse Trail improvements which will take place in the spring of 2018. Members of the nearby Queen's Green Community Garden, located at Queen and Mitchell Streets, have offered to help mentor and launch the new garden group. It's expected that some of the prospective gardeners on their wait list will join this new garden. Staff has, have received an expression of interest from the King East and Auditorium Neighborhood Associations to consider and assess a community garden in their neighborhoods. And also staff have received an expression of interest from the Cherry Park Neighborhood Association for a community garden in Gilder Green. And the city uh, intends to support these requests in 2018. So we'll be now happy to answer any of your questions that you may have. Yes, thank you. We do have some questions for you. Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair Ioannidis, and thank you for this report and, and for coming to us today. Uh, as you put the report together and gathered all the information, what were some of the, the, the main things or mainly repeated things you heard from people that were interested in putting uh, forward an idea for a garden? Just in general, there, you know, there's groups that are just kind of raring to go. And uh, we've been kind of working this year on, on sort of the internal process as well as sort of the application process and the steps by step and step by step. And they're, um, you know, they're they're wanting to get going. Yeah, I think you know what what the guide has done, and I give you high compliments on it because I have been involved with the Stanley Park Community Garden and all of the things that you know we came up against as as you start to progress. Uh, you know, we all oh, have to do this step, and, and now this is all, re you know, reflected in this. Um, the, you know, things like uh, insurance and tools and uh, water, uh, even soil. And I, I have to say, too, our, our staff have been amazing. Uh, Eckhart has gone way over and above uh, his staff duties to make this uh, happen. It's a personal passion of his. So uh, I really am glad it's, it's uh, same with the, the Neighborhood Matching Grant. We've really listened and we are really going to make this a lot easier and we're we're using all the experience and lessons we learn as we go and it, every time we do that it makes the next garden that much easier to come about so again a great guide thanks for listening mr croft you have something else to add yeah i'll just add in terms of what we heard from the community three things uh one is absolutely keep it simple and that's what we've tried to do um, two, walking distance is very important. Um, people don't want to have to drive to, to get to their garden, so if, if we need them located within neighborhoods with uh, proximity to gardeners. Um, and the third is the critical importance of water. Um, any gar gardens that don't have water are struggling, uh, and so we, we definitely want to make sure that in the future, new gardens have that water source right from the start. Councillor Schneider, did you say you were going to move this item? I will. Okay. Councillor Galloway Sealock. Yeah, I have just a couple questions. Um, my first one is with respect to um, the one that we've had to close out at the South District Park um, after they had been removed from the cemetery. What have been the plans for that community gardens and the and the users of that community garden? 
At this point, um, there is not a, a plan to um, create a new allotment garden. Uh, it's my understanding that in the past these were temporary measures and um, with the Love My Hood neighborhood strategy, we're focusing on resident-led, uh, the resident-led model or initiatives. Um, we are looking at uh, possible locations. Um, we've mapped uh, sort of the areas of the city where the former gardeners from Huron Farms um, lived and we're looking at locations that could accommodate uh, the, some of the displaced gardens. So, Ms. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Ms. McGoldrick, do you have something to add to that? Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, in terms of um, the allotment gardens, we did do a scan initially to look at um, whether there's any alternative uh, locations. Um, but what we really heard from the residents, and primarily through the neighborhood strategy, was that resident-led, uh, city-supported, uh, wanting neighborhood-based community gardens. And so as we looked at scoping uh, the community garden strategy um, and the program, we thought we would focus within that area. So I, I mean, Yvonne uh, did a great job of summarizing that. Uh, and perhaps, um, you know, when we look at the administrative support, we're looking at providing that support to residents. Um, the allotment garden is very uh, city heavy in terms of administration, and so we're, we're mirroring um, the strategy through the, the Love My Hood. I think part of my concern comes out of that um, when you look at the map, um, there's zero community gardens in Ward 5. There was that one temporary one, and I'm sure that a lot of the gardeners come from that area. And uh, so my question really is, is what is our plan for equity across the city with regards to community gardens? Because if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, you have three community gardens that you're planning to accept for 2018, but probably won't be built till 2019. So there's, or built in 2018, but we're still, I just saw you shaking your head. Um, um, so that means anything that's going to happen from those gardeners or the potential locations within, and I'm not just saying Ward 5, I can see in, in Ward 2 and Ward 1 there, you know, kind of the, the outskirts of the city don't seem to be getting the same service when it comes, to, or attention when it comes to this. Granted, resident-led, I understand that. How, how can we get more equity across the city? Uh, if, uh, hold on, Mr. May, okay. you... That's a good question. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's exactly why we have things like the matching grant, which have built into it equity across uh, all wards. But more importantly, that's exactly why we have assigned neighborhood liaisons. So once this program is approved, it's the neighborhood liaisons who are on the ground, not here at City Hall, but on the ground in your ward, talking to those groups, and now they'll be able to give them this easy steps guide and say, hey, what about a community garden? And so that's how these things are all connected, staff on the ground actually supporting them. And in fact, what we've seen is in areas uh, where activity, activity hasn't been as heavy, we've been successful in getting uh, work done through those liaisons. Yeah, and I can appreciate that, but we're still looking at supporting three more gardens in already heavily intensive community garden areas. And so I'm just concerned. Um, um, obviously, we can continue to work with some of the areas that are underrepresented, um, but uh, we need to continue to move forward. And my only other suggestion is that um, uh, the Huron Natural Area may be a, a, a location potentially um, for a community garden as well. Okay. Uh, for, with on, within city lands, just a thought. Um, but I'd really like to see some emphasis put on, on areas that uh, are underserviced with this respect. Okay. Thank you for that. I, I do agree with you, too, when I just look at a glance at what's existing right now. And if you look at what you see, it's, it's at least 50% are located in the downtown wards. So, yeah, I, I agree that is a concern. But then again, also the suburbs do have greater capacity with lands and with those properties. So there's got to be a balance in there. So I think, I think we're on that right path. Um, Councillor Fernandez. Yes, thanks Yvonne. Um, what happens when a community group wants to move forward on a community garden and they, because it says that, that they want, you want them to canvas the neighborhood and they get a negative response. How do we navigate through that? 
Well, I think the best way, rather than taking a negative response as a no, is, is working with um, the resident um, to identify their concerns. And I think a lot of times they could be addressed through um, sort of tweaks in, in the design of, of the garden, the layout, the um, delineation of the garden. Um, and so perhaps for a particular garden, you know, it might, um, the requirements might be slightly different to address um, those particular concerns. I, and I, I was thinking, because it tagged into my next question, was because you identified when they did the community engagement that there is there's a constant concern with theft and vandalism. I mean, I see even the Trinity Village Community Garden where um, s some people are picking <laughs> picking people picking fruit from other people's plants and gardens and, and walking out with them. Um, it, do you see that maybe taking those community people who originally may not have been as supportive as saying, you know, you can be the eyes on this garden, you can help by supporting the garden to reduce theft and vandalism in the gardens? Mr. Joseph, you have something to add to that? Sure, through you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I just want to echo Yvonne's comments that probably the best approach forward in those situations is through conversation. Um, I think sometimes there can be resistance to gardens um, because they're taking up land that maybe people are using for other things. Maybe there's a weekly soccer game that happens there, um, other uses of the space. So, you know, as Yvonne mentioned, you know, maybe through some dialogue, there's some compromise in terms of the layout of the garden, um, you know, how it looks, where it's at, you know, and you just got to have those conversations and hopefully you get to a point where people are in agreement on a way forward. Right. And I mean, we had a challenge in um, Pioneer Park on Green Valley Drive. It's called Pioneer Park, and it's on Green Valley Drive. Um, there was a, a group that wanted to do a community garden there, and, and we got some good support from staff at the time, but unfortunately the, the leader, the person who led it, um, moved away. How do we deal with that? Kind of, I mean, are you... Are you hoping that it won't just be one person who leads this, but there's, there's ownership again? It comes down to ownership, right? Making sure people buy into that and then continue for years afterwards. Mr. May, you have something to add? Yes, that's really, Mr. Chair. I'll take a quick shot at that, but I did want to come back to your last point. Um, that's why it's so important that we don't artificially go into a neighborhood and try to force a community garden. Uh, the three that are on tap for 2018 are because they are well on their way in the planning, built the community support, built the partnerships. And so once you have truly neighborhood resident led, there's a better chance that even if that one really strong volunteer leaves, someone else will pick it up. In terms of when challenges arise, that's the beauty of the system we have in place with the new neighborhood development office and the four neighborhood liaisons. Instead of having to have parks staff trying to navigate those challenges where their expertise is better spent on actually doing planning. We have now staff whose job, whose expertise and skills are to facilitate tough discussions amongst neighbors and so hopefully they can overcome those. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the, one, the one suggestion, and I was contacted by a resident who had uh, a garden out on, uh, here on farm is is that there is space in my ward where we could probably possibly look at, at creating a garden um, to move those displaced gardeners to another location. Um, I don't know if it's gotten if he's contacted any of staff yet, but I'm certainly happy to um, help them, him navigate that with any of the gardens that are interested gardeners that are interested in moving. Um, and I think that's important so that that momentum keeps going. And, um, and then they don't feel like they've just been tossed, <laughs> so to speak. Um, that's it. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Councillor Gazzola. Who, who or what is the Community Garden Council? I tried to get some information off of the Internet. Is that a local group? Is that a... That's what is it? Are they elected, appointed, or...? It is a local group, and um, they are, they're sort of an, um, under the umbrella of um, the region of Waterloo. They, they get, obtain some assistance from the region, but they are uh, 
residents and volunteers and uh, they they've got they provide great resources of a really wonderful um, website of resources for gardeners um, there's you know programming uh, grants that they obtain you know there's a lot of great work that they do and you know some some people have sometimes gone through and uh, connected with the community garden council to um, initiate a new garden in that and so we're working together we're going to work together with the garden council so that um, the people that can get sort of the help that they need okay. the way they need it okay so they're, they're sort of a committee of the region Pardon me? They're, they're somewhat like a committee of the region in the region yeah did you say okay. yes uh, yeah. under the regional government do you have any idea what kind of funding they get from the region I, uh, we do have a representative here for, from um, the council. Before that we might answer be able that question, Councillor Cazuolo, we our delegate here will be is next. I'm going to actually, as soon as you're done your questions, I'm going to have our delegate come in and present because uh, of timing and everything else and and the order of whoever's queued in. I will give them at that, that time when it comes to questions again. So. If you can ask another question, and then yeah, I didn't know that there was someone yeah. else here wasn't listed on the program. That's fine. I just want to learn a little bit about it. Uh, I guess I had another question about there was a hundred and forty thousand dollar grant was received. I, I guess that was with the community garden council also. Okay. Okay. On page three dash three and three dash four, we have a list of. Uh, of uh, community gardens, uh, did the city of Kitchener provide all the capital funding for <laughs> all of those that are listed there? Um, like some of them go way back. I I, I suspect that a, a good part of uh, the funding was provided by the city and in kind support as well for the establishment of those gardens. Ms. McGoldrick. Through you, Chair. Um, as Yvonne mentioned, many of these go back quite, uh, quite a way historically, so we don't have the historical financial information, but looking at the levels of support that we've been providing, um, you know, leading up to this review, a lot of it has been in um, intensive in-kind support um, and providing materials and tools and staff undertaking uh, the work, which has been... Um, you know, uh, resource intensive in terms of the city's participation. Um, so we we haven't okay. done. I appreciate that. I, I, excuse me for for cutting in, but my time is dwindling away here. So so we we provide capital assistance. How about operating these, uh, looking after these gardens uh, every year? Do we provide other assistance and other funds? Does the city do that? We have a whole we have a big large list here. Do we have a uh, so again, through you, Chair, we would provide assistance through in-kind where the city would um, provide their resources to undertake a number of work. We haven't handed money over to the gardeners, but we've undertaken work in support of the garden. Group. But in-kind, there's a cost. Do we have any idea uh, of what we spend annually on these? I do have um, what we have uh, uh, budgeted annually. Um, in terms of operating cost, it's approximately fifteen thousand dollars annually for all of these gardens here. That's correct. Although I should say that uh, twelve thousand dollars of that had been identified for the allotment garden. For, I'm sorry for the what? Uh, for the Huron Farms allotment garden, there is monies allocated um, historically for um, the more labor intensive. Uh, uh, city staff uh, resources associated with the Huron Farms lands. So, so you're telling me all the other gardens here get three thousand dollars to help them during the year? That's correct. Okay. The uh, just one I want to point out. Uh, uh, the, it's uh, on three four the Salvation Army Hope and Unity Community Garden. There are a hundred plots there, and it says other. So that's it's not on city land. Correct. That, so who, what city support do they get? They're on our list here. Do they, did, we, did they get uh, capital funding to set that up? 
I believe that I believe that they did get some capital funding to initiate that garden through the through the chair rather than staff speculating on what might have happened historically if there are specific questions we could possibly take them away and follow up I'm just a little uncomfortable with staff speculating okay <laughs> all right one one final question I, I have no problems with what you're doing you're doing an excellent job and I, I'm just trying to see how it is divided up and what it does cost and whatnot uh, just one other quick question uh, and, and, and 100 years ago, I was also had a plot in a community garden. Uh, who, I, I noticed who get if there's a waiting list, everybody would like to get into a garden. Who gets in and who decides, no, you, don't, you get a plot and you're on a waiting list? Who decides that? It's uh, the community garden committee uh, that, that decides that. When you say community garden committee, does each garden plot have their own committee? Are they the ones that make those decisions? Or? Each uh, garden. So it, it may be 10 plots or 50 plots yeah. or so. They each have a committee that uh, makes certain decisions okay. pertaining to that garden, and they would um, maintain a, a the, the uh, wait list and the city oversees all of these community groups um, hmm. well we must have some kind of relationship with them where we are insuring each one of these lots are we not uh, as an example on that salvation Ms. Fletcher can you address that please well through the chair I think what we're here to present is a new way of operating moving forward and so I'm, I'm, I think we will see changes as we move down the road. So I, I think staff is struggling with answering questions about what might have happened in the past versus what the intention is moving forward. Okay. All right. Is it? Um, Councilor Zola, mm -hmm. your time has, has been overextended so if you want to ask further questions just cue back in. can I ask one little quick little question uh, in fairness you've already been over a minute and a half over your time um, and we do have a delegate and I want to call the delegate up so th thank you Ms. Okay. Uh, thank Mr. You. our next delegate up is Carol Popovic from the region of Waterloo Public Health Sorry, I, I would have called you sooner, but I looked at it said video, and I just thought it was just a video of you, or so okay. I didn't realize it was okay. Um, welcome. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Carol Pavovich. I'm a public health nurse from Region of Waterloo Public Health and Emergency Services Healthy Living Dis Division. Here to just public health. <laughs> And um, I'm here to provide some background information about the Community Garden Network and Council and to describe public health's role in supporting community gardens in the region. Public health recognizes community gardens have a role in chronic disease prevention and placemaking within neighborhoods. And public health supports Community Garden Council and Network through part-time staff support through myself and uh, the website development and maintenance and other in-kind supports. A local study conducted by Dr. Ellen Desjardins reveals that community gardens are linked to positive health impacts, food and nutrition, enhanced meals and diet, physical activity, mental stress reduction, and people save money on food. And um, community gardens are also important in uh, inclusion and uh, community building, preserving culture, and involving young children. And this is what 82 gardeners have told us. This, this is information coming from the gardeners. And also learning. It supports curiosity and skill building, whether it's from how do I grow this new seed into a plant and or environmental sustainability or just skill building, you know, taking a produce from your garden and taking it into your kitchen and learning how to cook that particular um, produce. And so uh, I do have a, a very short clip from a video, and this was done by Dwight Storing. I know um, Councillor Etherington is uh, friends with Dwight. And uh, it basically shows a gardener 
um, story and how the garden helped restore help, hope in a very difficult time in his life. So we're just going to quickly show that uh, clip. Come here, you find a nice uh, environment. Uh, so instead of spending time watching TV, sometimes I bring my paper with me, so I read something like that. So I came here to spend some time digging, uh, cleaning, uh, removing the weeds, uh, watering, uh, uh, chatting with people. When my wife found that she has this mild diabetes, so she started to change her eating style. So she focused on veggies now. But you know, sometimes these veggies, based on the season, they are expensive. So you cannot always drink, for example, squash or let's say eggplants. So sometimes you cannot find them easily. Also, yeah. the best way is to plant them in our plots. My gardening experiences began when I was about five years old and we were downtown at a little village, or not the village, the town of St. Mary's and some woman gave me a package of pumpkin seeds. I don't know who she was, I went home, I planted the pumpkins, had huge success and from there on in I was hooked. As a chef, uh, I, I think the two, the gardening and the chefing came together very well. The freshness and the flavor of homegrown food is amazing. Nothing's nicer than to make a salad out of your garden. You pick it, you go home, you eat it, poof. I think the garden keeps you physically fit. It also is good for the spirit and the heart. And you are somehow in the dirt and in the earth. You see things growing. It restores hope. Gardeners are afflicted with hope. They, they are absolutely one of the most hopeless of the hopeful. The garden has been a source of healing for me. Uh, I lost one of my brothers, very tragically, and through the garden, I was able, I think, to restore my soul. Um, thank you. So um, Public Health has supported um, the Community Garden Network since the 90s. And in 2005, it spearheaded the development of the Community Garden Council, which is a volunteer group. It's not really a regional committee. The work of the Council uh, supporting community gardens demonstrates an excellent example of how volunteerism and multiple partnerships can create a groundswell movement. And since 2005, the number of gardens has grown from 25 to 76 region-wide. And this was done with the help of multiple partnerships and volunteer efforts of garden coordinators. Each garden coordinator contributes about 300 hours per year per garden, totaling close to 23,000 volunteer hours and benefiting over 1,500 households. Public Health supported the Community Garden Council in several um, special projects and we were able to acquire over $350,000 for these projects. The $140,000 grant was for the Accessible Community Garden Grant. Um, some of the projects included the Community Capacity Builder to help to support and sustain gardens so that once gardens started, they, the garden coordinators felt they had enough support that they were sustained and didn't close. And um, the other project was multicultural garden project and that was to promote gardens to multicultural communities and that resulted in many different cultures joining in community gardens and as well the creation of four multicultural community gardens targeting newcomers and then the other project was the accessible garden project um, that was meant to reduce physical barriers so everyone can garden and accessibility features were installed in four community gardens two of which are located in Kitchener Trinity Village and Chandler Mowat. And now we're currently working on the school garden project. We're currently promoting the benefits of school gardening to teachers, parent councils and school boards. And through partnership with Seeds of Diversity and funding by the Healthy Kids Community Challenge, seven elementary school gardens are being installed. There's going to be an online curriculum resource. Uh, there will be a school garden workshop and a series of inspirational videos 
are being created featuring Waterloo Region students starting and participating in school gardens. And I just want to say, um, Region of Waterloo Public Health and myself, we're just thrilled about the support that the City of Kitchener has given and will be providing to community gardens. And we really thank you for your contribution to the health and many other positive impacts gardens provide for residents and their neighbourhoods. And it's just a special um, thank you to Josh, Darren and Yvonne for all of the hard work that they've done. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Popovich. Um, all the committee members that are clicked in right now, is it questions for the delegate? Okay. Okay. Mayor Verbanovic. Thank you very much and, uh, and thank you uh, for, for being here and, and providing a little bit of the, um, the regional perspective. I'm just wondering how, you know, from your knowledge, how we're comparing as a municipality in comparison to the others in the region or even in communities outside of that in terms of adoption of community gardens. Well, I just want to tell you that City of Kitchener has been inspirational. Um, you developed a policy back in the late 90s, and that policy has sh been shared throughout the province, Kingston, London, uh, Peterborough, and um, they use that policy to craft their own, and there are now active community garden networks in those cities as well. So the City of Kitchener has been very proactive and um, continues to be proactive in supporting community gardens. Fantastic. Is there um, anything, um, you know, from, from the work that you've done um, and, and the, the, the broader network that you're involved with across the province, is there anything yet that's sort of still missing in ours uh, as we go forward that you think we maybe should still look at? or? Well, I think um, we're off to a very good start. Um, water was a, a huge barrier for a lot of the gardens, and people have uh, tried to harvest rainwater, but um, you can only harvest so much when you have a dry summer. <laughs> so uh, having water support is going to be excellent, and um, the proposed um, assistance that the city is offering uh, to help new gardens, I think is, is going to be fantastic in maintaining and sustaining gardens. So I think we're off to a great start. <laughs> Wonderful. And then I guess the last question um, is, and I, I guess it's partially a question for you and partially for um, the earlier uh, speaker, but I'm just wondering if, um, you know, I, as I think back, when we originally started this, it was, um, it was an effort that, that happened in the Victoria Hills uh, neighborhood. Um, do, we, do we tend to see a, a higher um, uptake in, in areas where perhaps there is some, some, some lower income and, and so on and, and folks want to engage in this either um, for, a, you know, for food but, but also in terms of community building and so on? Um, and as as we go forward, um, is there any work that we maybe need to do either together with you or with others, particularly to make sure that um, it, it's being seen as 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 welcoming as possible by new Canadians? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we did um, promote the gardens in ten of the most recent um, newcomer languages, so we did uh, have that. Um, bookmark out and um, I know many of the gardens have new, have many different cultures involved and it's it's really um, in, encouraging and kind of fun because uh, the garden in Shelley Cortland which is a low-income neighborhood they have about 10 plots and uh, no two plots speak the same language oh, wow. so it comes into some really interesting um, you know sign language Sure. to communicate with each other and uh, to make the garden grow. The one thing I would say in those particular situations is that um, you need some support on the ground, especially when the neighborhood is transient. Um, you need to have that one person who can kind of hold the ground um, for the, the fact that many people are changing and uh, moving uh, around. So um, 
And, and that was a similar thing that happened at Victoria Hills as well. It kind of fell into disrepair. But then we had a wonderful person come forward, Heather McDermott, and she was determined to start a garden. And she, uh, I said, well, hey, why, why start one? We have one here at Victoria Hills. It could really use your help. So she got in there and she developed um, a committee. So I really recommend now that the gardens um, have a, a small group um, that they can learn from each other and support each other, say, if one or two people move on then there's always that other person who can, can carry on with the management of the garden. And so all the gardens are very um, grassroots oriented, they're grassroots managed, and um, I think it's a good model. Um, we try to help them if they have special projects they want to do, we try to help them access funds, and um, we try to work with them. And uh, once or twice a year we have a, a garden network meeting not everybody comes, but it's a good support for um, everyone involved and they get ideas from each other as to how to problem solve. I know we did have problems with theft and vandalism in the past, but you know, aside from some of our more colorful gardeners chasing down the would-be thief, <laughs> um, I'm sure you would know this individual if I said her name, but uh, you know, the theft is a small part of the garden and uh, Chandler Mowat did have someone come in and, and reap the garden because people get this idea that it's a community garden, it's there for the community, and we can come in and help ourselves to the produce. So I think signage is one thing that would be helpful too. Um, just saying the garden produce belongs to the gardeners. Um, but uh, what Chandler Mowat did, um, of course that's another low income in a neighborhood and they had all their efforts into this garden and someone came and stole the produce. So they had a sneaking suspicion as to who did it. <laughs> so they invited him to be a part of the garden the following year. And there hasn't been a problem with that since. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for all your efforts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Marsh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, just a quest couple questions. One, uh, have you noticed in region-wide any trends uh, towards having more uh, uh, demand for community garden plots in the more dense urban areas compared to the suburban areas, or is that more is that unique to Kitchener? Well, it seems as though most of the gardens are aligned along the transit uh, line, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking this is probably. Um, accessibility. It's a place that people can access fairly easy and so those were the original um, places. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't really noticed, uh, you know, um, say some of the outlying neighborhoods as opposed to the inner neighborhoods, but we must uh, realize that with the intensification program that uh, there is less and less green space for people to plant and grow and um, People crave green space and sometimes, you know, some people say, well, community gardens, it's all about community building. Well, sometimes for some people, it's just about going to a place where it's quiet, where they can relax and just enjoy the, um, enjoy nature. Sure. Okay. Thank you. And uh, in the past, my understanding was that uh, there was a program for people who had too much space on their own property and were willing to let someone who didn't have enough space to, to uh, plant a garden on their property. Do we still have that borrow a plot uh, type program? Well, that was a project of the KW Urban Harvesters and that was run uh, mostly by University of Waterloo students. And they still maintain that somewhat, but it really just depends on the student and how much um, time and resources they have to promote that. So it's not really carrying uh, the way that it could, but um, okay. I think they still do it. <laughs> okay, is it more uh, informal? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, so we're looking at supporting three new gardens at, two, at a maximum of three new gardens a year uh, with this report. Uh, is that enough, do you think, or do you think that if there was a higher demand that uh, there'd be any 
capacity from uh, the region to support additional uh, gardens or expanding existing gardens? Yeah. The region um, did support some gardens through their Environmental Sustainability Fund, and they also did um, a while back support um, financially the uh, creation of some of the other gardens through their Healthy Communities Grant. But um, there's not really a um, policy per se at the region level for starting uh, gardens. Now they do provide my support, uh, part-time support to sort of uh, problem solve and um, troubleshoot with gardeners and um, mm -hmm. and also some of the in-kind um, supports like meeting space and that sort of thing, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Popovich. Okay. We don't have any thank further. You. Oh, you have further delegate? Okay. Councillor Gazola. No, Ms. Popovich, we do have some, we do have a question for you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, are you here today as a, as a volunteer of the Community Garden Council or as a rep of the Waterloo Region Public Health? Uh, well, my involvement with the Garden Council is uh, staff support. So basically the model of the council, and perhaps we should have chosen a better name other than council, but uh, it's really a council to the gardens, uh, for the gardens, um, support and advisory. Um, so I'm there as staff support, and um, the, the council decides its direction, and I'm there to help them make it happen. That's fine, that's good. Uh, to, to whom does the council answer? Themselves, I guess. Okay, that's, um, no, that's fine. Uh, the, uh, you stated that uh, somewhere that you have 25 to 76 gardens. That you, you're talking about the community council. Well, since the council started, we had 25 gardens when it first started, and now they're over 76. Now, where, where are those? Are, those, are some of those counted uh, on the list that we have, or are those separate yeah. gardens? No, those include those on the list. So it's really a community partnership model. So um, we're there to help and support. So uh, if a group wants to start a garden, um, for example, the Stanley Park Garden, um, uh, someone called me and said, hey, I want to start a garden. So I said, well, there are some things you need to do, and it's not going to be a automatic process. So I sort of walked them through the steps and said, you know, um, you really need a, a small committee to do this. It's a big job and too much for one person to do. You should really get in touch with the city if you're wanting to start the garden on city land. Of course, there are other um, sites and locations that you can also explore, but uh, securing a site is, is one of the first steps and um, get your uh, city support. Um, call your city councilor and see what kinds of supports are available to you through the city, and um, I'm, I'm here to kind of encourage you and uh, problem solve with you along the way. Okay. So I don't, I don't go to the particular garden site. I don't help with the build. I'm just more um, background support. Yeah. Uh, of the 76 gardens, how many of those would be in Kitchener? Do you have any idea? Uh, I think pretty much all of those on the list um, that you have. Um, I think there are about 34. In Kitchener? Yeah. Of your 76? Pardon? Of the 76? Yeah. yeah. So City of Kitchener is ahead of the, the, the rest of the gang in its support of community gardens. Uh, I must say that faith communities have been a huge uh, support of gardens as well. So. In some of the other cities, that's where most of the gardens are located, are on church property. Okay, one, one, thank you. One final question. Can you just give me a little more indication or detail? You received, I guess, the council received the 140,000 uh, Canada 150 grant. Can you just tell me what, how, how was that spent? What? Well, uh, we actually have received a lot more money than that. So More? We, we've had over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars 
uh, go through for the various projects. But the $140,000 was for the installation of accessibility features in for the gardens. Where? So, uh, two in uh, City of Kitchener. One was at Trinity Village and the other one's at Chandler Mowat. So that's hard surface pathways and raised garden beds. Okay. And it costs a lot of money okay. Thank to put you. that in. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. Thank you Thank very you. much, Ms. Popovich. Okay, so to continue with questions to staff, I have in order Mayor, Mayor Barry Banovic. And then I have Councillor Etherington. And then I have Councillor Marsh. And then I have Councillor Gazola for a second time. Okay, and then after that, anyone else can queue in, please. So, Mayor Verbanovic. Thank you, I, I just really wanted to uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, staff and everybody um, from the, that's been involved uh, from the, the, the council and, and beyond in terms of um, getting this new uh, report and new policy uh, forward to us. Council might recall that when uh, we did the, the neighborhood consultations, um, the issue of community gardens was uh, one of the items that, that came forward significantly from uh, from citizens in, in, in our community uh, as something that they would like to uh, to see more of as we worked on the neighborhood strategy. And so I think this is uh, certainly a, a step in the uh, in the right direction um, to, to allow that to in fact happen, which uh, does ultimately uh, build community um, through the participation of, of those who are involved. As was pointed out, um, you know, we did some, some, some real leadership work on this. Um, and I know there were uh, people like, like Clara Nowak and others that were very instrumental back in the original um, community garden. And this is going back to the days when Councillor Wiley was still around uh, the Council Horseshoe and she was uh, a champion of it uh, back then to get the initial community garden going and to see how it's... Uh, uh, flourished, I know, uh, would certainly make her and uh, and those who uh, were involved in those early years um, very very pleased to see how we've uh, adopted this as uh, as a community. Uh, I think it is important as we go forward to continue to look for ways to make sure that we 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 cover the entire city as much as possible. Um, certainly, I think there is greater demand in areas where there is less green space and and uh, um, and intensification occurs because simply because people have no other option but to look at a community garden. Whereas when you get out into the suburbs, folks still have properties where they can have them in many cases in their uh, in their own backyards. Um, so uh, you know, I, I think that that is a balancing fact uh, as as well. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm very pleased to, uh, to see this coming forward, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing them continue to flourish around the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Etherington. Through you, Mr. Chair, a couple of quick questions. I think our kitchen and gardens are excellent. I think it's much easier than nowadays to understand the wording of uh, what's involved in getting a garden off the ground. No, I shouldn't say off the ground. My first question has to do with uh, a problem I ran into in the ward. I've got about 10, maybe 11 gardens in my ward. And one had to do with water. There was an arrangement where if a garden did not have water, they hooked into a neighboring house. Did we ever sort that problem out as we move forward? Has that now gone, or what is the situation? Ms. Fletcher? Um, through the chair, uh, that's not the preferred solution moving forward. Uh, for Kitchener Utilities, what I can say is Kitchener Utilities will be at the table during any consultation and supportive of finding the right solution for that garden in terms of provision of water. 
So what have they done in the meantime for water? Through the chair, are you talking about existing gardens? Yes. We are circling back to review the existing gardens that do not have water. I don't, I don't have an answer on the specific garden you're referring to today. Okay, thank you. And my second question has to do with the recent food forest projects. I wanted to ask staff if we could increase education about these gardens, particularly the one in Victoria Park, which recently, I think, lost a third of its food forest by parks employees mowing them down, not knowing that that was a food forest. So I think our education needs to uh, spread a little on food forest projects. Could I get a response on that? Ms. McGoldrick? Yes, through you, Chair. Um, I agree that the, that the Victoria Park food forest uh, mowing was very unfortunate. As part of the community garden um, program development, we've done a, um, an exercise in mapping out both food forests and community gardens. And we quickly realized when that incident occurred that we needed to share that information and made sure that um, on, on cruise maintenance plans that these features were included. So that is a lesson learned and a takeaway, and we've shared that uh, with staff. Thank you very much. And my last question, when I was a kid, and I used to steal gooseberries from allotments. Those allotments in England were on railway lands, usually on railway embankments. Now maybe that was back in the day where we didn't have the horror of risk and insurance and liability. Do we ever consult with the railway as far as using some of their empty lands around Kitchener for gardens? Who cares? Okay, I was going to ask who's going to tackle that one. Mr. Joseph. Uh, through the chair. Um, I think it's important to note that in the work that we're putting forward to council, soil testing is a really big component uh, as we install new gardens. So that's just something to keep in mind. I think we're open to partnerships, talking to different groups, railway companies, whoever, but if the lands are contaminated, which they might be in that case, um, we wouldn't obviously support a garden. Uh, in those areas. So as much as possible, gardens should go, you know, where there's good soil quality, there wasn't any history of past contamination. I can't speak on the railway companies, but, you know, that would just be a natural step that we would do regardless of the site. So I should be dead by now, right? <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Did Councillor Marsh, did we have you, did we talk to you or did you just click, click, click back in again? You were next, right? Okay, because I thought you clicked out. Okay. Okay, Councillor Marsh. Thanks. I have a question and a comment. Should I wait? Or? Sure, you can make your comments. Okay, quick. I'll just say that first, uh, I want to ask staff, where is the demand? Um, because I, I am concerned that if, you know, as a, as a downtown councillor, uh, where we do have the most community gardens, if it's an unfair uh, system, then I, I would uh, be sensitive to that. Uh, I'm just wondering, do we have a fair amount of demand in the suburban areas for more community gardens? Or is it, is it more, are we noticing that it's more in the urban areas? Ms. McGoldrick? Oh, oh go ahead. Okay, there's three, there's, f f who, who's going to address this one? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, Ms. McGoldrick. So through you, Chair. Um, the, the focus has been for 2018 to look at um, those uh, interested gardeners that have come forward to date with plans to develop community gardens. And so um, essentially wanted, we, we had those individuals in a bit of a holding pattern while we worked through some of the logistics and we were able to support um, one community garden in 2017. Um, but we haven't thoroughly communicated the new program. And so I don't think, we, we know that there's demand. We've heard through the neighborhood strategy consultation um, that likely the demand is throughout the city. 
Uh, but we haven't done a lot of uh, communication in terms of what the new program looks like, and that will be the next step um, in terms of the outcomes of today. And then we anticipate through the grant process getting a better understanding of where uh, the need is and where the demands are. The other thing in terms of equity, um, the grant program in terms of selection criteria does recognize um, or, or does try to encourage new gardens and areas where there are no existing gardens, and mm -hmm. so that will that is part of the proposed selection criteria in the grant program to try to create equity throughout the city. Okay, good. And then the other question I had was, why do we need a deadline uh, of is it June first or I forget the exact date? Uh, why do we need a deadline? Uh, I mean, if, if I, as a, if a neighborhood was trying to organize to get a community garden going and they missed the deadline by a month or, or, or whatever, then they would essentially have to wait two years uh, to, uh, to see a garden happen where they want to have a garden. I'm just wondering. Mr. Joseph. Through you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so as Denise uh, suggested, we definitely have to ramp up our marketing communications efforts following um, this report to let people know of the, the deadline that is uh, coming. The reason, part of the reason to have a deadline is just to be more fair and equitable, right? So in the past, garden requests came various times throughout the year, and if the city is only able to support a very few limited amount, then we should be able to look at all the requests for gardens in front of us and make decisions based on how well those meet the criteria. Criteria. And so a deadline helps us do that. Um, and it also, um, we kind of set the deadline for June 1st for the preceding year just because of the work involved in getting the site ready, prep, soil tested, water connections. Um, it's quite a lot of work that needs to happen. And so um, that was sort of our line of thinking. But definitely with the lens of being fair, equitable, and kind of looking at all the options at one time. It would be just great to um, make sure that in future when, let's say, uh, the demand slows down a little, that, that the deadline does not deter people from applying at any time in the year because, because uh, ideally we'd, we'd be meeting the demand and then m perhaps we'd have more room to meet the demand after the deadline even. So just wanted to flag that. Um, yeah, and so just a comment, just to say I am a major, big proponent of community gardens. I think it, that uh, it's wonderful. I would like to see them all over the city, not just where they are now. Uh, I think that uh, one of the one of the beautiful parts about uh, coming together at a community garden is learning from other members of the community about different types of uh, vegetables or fruits and uh, learning different de gardening techniques and coming together but also as was mentioned earlier by uh, our delegation that you know gardens are uh, a haven uh, a, a much needed green space that sometimes people who might live in a um, a, a dense uh, area like a, an apartment building uh, would not have access to otherwise. So it's an important amenity, and uh, I'd like to see us uh, really uh, move forward uh, to the maximum capacity that we that we are able to. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gazzola. This is these are all second round questions, just for everyone to know. These were all second questions? Yeah, right? from that, well, no, you are starting from you. Okay. I was glad that's clarified. Is, are the, is the community garden program inside or outside of the matching grant program? Sorry, so, through, through the chair, it's a separate grant program. So if, if I wanted to, could I, could a group apply for a community garden within the matching grant program? Not the way that we've set this up, no. Why not? The reason being is we want it to be consistent with the grant that currently exists. So the city's had a grant for community gardens specifically in the past. Um, and the, the type of garden we're talking about is plots. Right, so assigned plots, volunteer driven, growing food, um, that kind of thing. So our line of thinking was keep the grant 
consistent, it already exists. Um, through the matching grant, we might be able to fund other enhancements to existing gardens. We might be able to fund um, other forms of gardens like food hedges and stuff like that. So there's definitely some flexibility there. But if we're talking about gardens, you know, in the traditional sense with plots and that sort of thing, our intention was to just keep the uh, existing grant as we have it. Thank you. I find that somewhat duplication of services and uh, doesn't make sense, but that's another issue. Uh, with the existing gardens that we have now, how many of them have uh, city water, access to city water? And if they do, is that an ongoing thing and who pays for that water? Do we know the answers? I can wait. I don't need to know today. Okay, I'll wait, thank you. A final question on, on gardens that are on other than city property, such as the Salvation Army one that I pointed out, are those gardens covered under the city's insurance plan? Through the chair, the city's insurance plan only applies to gardens on city-owned land. Okay, so... Uh, on those lists on t that, that are here, anything that's on other, will, they will not be covered uh, under the city's insurance. Do the, do the community people that have those pro uh, lots, plots on those gardens, do they realize that? So uh, through the chair, we will need to communicate that in our materials and we can definitely make that clear um, but yes, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be covered because it is an on-city-owned lands. Thank you. Councillor Fernandez? I don't have a question, I just have a comment. Okay. So having um, gone through an, an interesting experience with the group who wanted to put a, a garden uh, on Green Valley, I'm really happy to see that we're getting rid of some of the red tape. We're looking at areas all across the city and we're being very open to more community gardens because um, as our previous delegate um, discussed hope springs eternal with a gardener we're always hopeful we plant those seeds and we're always hoping that something's going to grow so if there's any group that's more optimistic i don't know i think gardeners are very optimistic and in in building gardens you build bridges and you build community and you share your food um, we're fortunate enough to have a garden on our own property, and I think that's what, I, and I see more and more in my community of people who are transfer, transferring and changing their, you know, green space or their big grassy lawns into gardens, and maybe that's why there's not as much request for community gardens in those areas. But I think it, it as people find success, in community gardens and share the wealth of their abundance of their fruit and vegetables and find other ways to learn to grow other things. I think that community gardens will spring up in other areas um, where we will see more denser population and denser in uh, intensification. So um, I think it's, it's wonderful that we have set some guidelines. I think that's important because otherwise it can get a little bit out of control. Uh, and I'm glad to see that we are going to continue to move forward on more community gardens. Uh, as people hear about it, either through social media, through their, other, through their friends who live in the city um, who have a community garden, I think we will see this spread all the way through the city. And it was really encouraging to hear our regional representatives say to us that we are really uh, forward-thinking in this community, that we've already pushed out that... Um, that parameter uh, where we were before with community gardens and then we just continue to push it out further and further. So thanks for the report and um, I look to seeing us grow more. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor galloway Sealock. I just want to say that I raise my concerns with regards to equity because we had probably one of the largest community gardens at the cemetery and then they got moved to here on farms and now they have nowhere um, that's in, within a remote close area to that and so that's where my concern uh, stemmed from I'm sure there's plenty of people who would like to or do 
garden in their own yard, but that defeats the purpose of a community garden. The, every, all the benefits that people are talking about, like learning from one another and having that opportunity. So it's not just about density, and it's not just about um, you know not having the opportunity within your own yard. It's about being with people and doing a common, common interest, and I think that needs to be divided. Maybe not equally, but... I think attention needs to be paid. And where my concern stemmed from is the next three, again, are going to be kind of in the, the core of the city. And knowing that we've lost a large one, um, I was just hoping to see something different. But again, it comes to the fact that this is a community garden where people get to come together. So I, I appreciate the program, and I understand the way it's going to unfold. And I thank staff for their work. Thank you. Councilor Gazzola, are you comments? Okay. Go ahead. What if I had another question? What was it do? Tell me where to go. No, we, we, can we just stay to the... To the uh, pardon? Can we just stick to the comments? Because we, no, we're, we're, yeah, we're, this I, item's gone. We don't want to be frivolous here. I just want to say, uh, speak in support of the uh, gardens. Uh, I was involved early on with Councilor Wiley in the former years, I had my own plot, so I, I'm well aware of what the uh, gardens could do. I, quite frankly, uh, I think we should be doing more in that in that in this area. When I when I see fifty, sixty thousand dollars for community grants, and here I'm seeing very little in capital, and I hear two or three thousand dollars a year to to help. Uh, maintain and support these gardens. I, uh, quite frankly, uh, think uh, there should be more done for it because it does. It really does involve a lot of people, and it answers a lot of questions. It, it does. It does answer questions not only to the community aspect of it, but a lot of people do. Uh, uh, a lot of people like to do it for for recreation. It's a form of recreation. A lot of people like to do it to help put food on their table. So I, I think it's a, an important program. There's no question that the city has been a leader in this, and I would like to see us uh, carry on. We, we have new programs. I hope, I hope the new programs doesn't bring a lot of new rules and regulations, and I hope to see the, a lot more than uh, three, uh, three new gardens every year. A lot of, a lot of space around. Okay, thank you. We don't have any further questions or comments or anything with that. I'll just say I'm just, this is, this is a, a topic that I know when it was first uh, um, elected to Ward 7, um, it wasn't really a topic that, it was a topic that was, you know, people did discuss, but not as much as it is in the last, uh, I would say, last three, four years. It's just, uh, it's, it's growing, and no pun intended, and I think it's, the movement of community gardens as a whole is growing and uh, I think that's a really good thing because it has so many benefits to the community. Um, Councillor Fernandez? Just asking for a recorded vote please. Okay and with that we have a recorded vote and it's been moved by Councillor Schneider. Um, Recorded vote. And it's carried unanimously, and I know Councillor Marsh would have voted in favor of that if she was here. Okay. Councillor Ineski as well. Okay. Um, with that, we will move on to item number four, dealing with the Kitchener Growth Management Plan. And Ms. Goss is here to present.
Welcome, Ms. Goss. <laughs> Good afternoon. Afternoon, right? Pardon me? Afternoon, oh, yeah. right? Still? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did I say good morning? <laughs> oh, okay. I'll keep the presentation <laughs> short. I understand we have one delegation on this matter today. So before you this afternoon is the Kitchener Growth Management Plan for the next two years, and it represents the fourth uh, KGMP since uh, Council approved the Growth Management Strategy in 2009. The KGMP has used the same evaluation criteria since 2009 to manage growth in an effective and coordinated manner. The KGMP is an evolution of the staging of development plan, which represented over 40 years of growth management and planning. So we've been doing this for a number of decades. The KGMP is a resource that's developed in consultation with many internal divisions, including transportation services, finance, legal, building, engineering, and so on, external agencies, landowners, and stakeholders. And it's a resource that we all use across the city as staff and external agencies to develop work programs for the coming years. Uh, the infrastructure timing that is put forward in this plan is considered in the context of this year's upcoming budget preparations. And staff have worked hard together internally across many divisions to ensure that the priorities of this plan are considered based on the timing of the required infrastructure to support that growth across the city. The KGMP, as you can see on the summary map that's in front of you, includes three priorities. Uh, there's a table on a, your agenda package of the report, page 4-2, that provides a description of those priorities. Um, essentially, it's a stoplight system with priority A being green-lighted applications that uh, would complete a community that is already under development. Priority B includes lands that have some additional infrastructure required or are dependent on infrastructure that is necessary through other lands or the development of other lands first. Priority C includes lands that typically require additional studies or the timing of infrastructure that's required for the development of that community is farther into the future. There's a second table on the agenda page 4-2 that outlines the number of parcels of uh, each of those respective priorities. You'll note that priority A has more than 20 intensification areas throughout the city and 21 additional parcels, generally in uh, Grand River, Dune South, and Laurentian West that are priority A. Priority B, there's 30 parcels that are given priority B um, as part of this KGMP, and they're located mainly in Dune South, Huron South, Brigadoon, and uh, most of Rosenberg. And this is a significant increase from the last KGMP and includes 24 parcels. Priority C includes two intensification areas, and they're related to the Freeport Force Main uh, that uh, should be pending completion this year, and five parcels in Hidden Valley. And this is a decrease in Priority C from 14 parcels uh, two years ago. The new thing that you will see as part of this KGMP is a future planning community identified as Dundee North. These, uh, this area represents additional lands that was added to the city's urban area through the latest regional official plan approval. We will use the same process that we use, was used uh, previously to identify new urban lands, um, as we did as part of Rosenberg community when those lands were brought into the city's urban area. And it's anticipated that planning in this area will commence in 2019. All required future studies will be determined through terms of reference that will be prepared as part of that work and will be considered in the city's new development charges background study uh, that's set to commence uh, next year. A draft of this plan was circulated to stakeholders and property owners in early August and staff also attended a Waterloo Region Home Builders Association Kitchener Committee meeting in September. The vast majority of properties within the city are priority A and B, although it's noted that certain priority B sites require some additional infrastructure. There's a significant inventory for development and substantial work for staff to continue to undertake over the coming years. And just to conclude, I understand that there is a delegation from MHBC, uh, Ms. Sinclair, on behalf of Activa, regarding a portion of their lands located south of parcel number 31, and you can see that in the Huron South area. 
So there's a sliver of land that is owned by Activa that's located just south of number 31. Those lands currently have urban land uses. The majority of the land uses on those lands is designated low-rise residential in the city's official plan. At this time, and in consultation uh, with internal departments and in consultation with the uh, delegation, um, it's staff's intent to process any applications on those lands as part of any amendments to the Huron South Community Plan within the time frame of this KGMP. That was always our intent with the commentary that we provided in the staff report. At this time, staff is recommending an amendment to their recommendation to assign this portion of Activa's lands only, a KGMP parcel ID, and assign it the same priority as the remainder of Huron South, which is priority B. This will provide additional clarity for the property owner um, and certainty as the KGMP goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goss. We have several members for questions. Councillor Davey. Uh, actually, I was going to move uh, the amended recommendation, but I suppose we could hear from the delegate first if the delegate's planning to speak. Are you going to move it? Yes. Okay. All right. Why don't we just hear the delegate then? You want to? You wanna... Okay. Go I'm. Ahead. I'm just trying to understand what parcel we're talking about with regards to giving with the amendment. Um, so, Natalie, what um, you're going to give it ID number 147, but we don't have that on our map. So, I'm just trying to understand. You said it's a sliver. Yeah. I don't so know what sliver that is. Through the chair on agenda page number uh, four. Dash 26 to 4 dash 28 is MHBC's submission. And in that submission, they have outlined the portion of Activa's lands that um, they would like included. Unfortunately, if the copy in front of you is black and white, it's That's going okay, to be hard to it. hear. Uh, Miss Sinclair does have a color copy that she's uh, more than willing to show, and that will give you a clear indication of the lands that we're talking about. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Is Ms. Sinclair? Is it Ms. Sinclair? Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I do have, if, if the overhead projector is working, I can put them up. Okay, on. sure. That would be great. So it's the rectangle outlined in red just south of 31. So <clears throat> I appreciate the committee letting me substitute in for Mr. Chauvin, uh, who couldn't make it at the last minute. Um, I understand Ms. Goss's um, recommendation, and we're in support of that. It's what I had intended to request today, that um, these lands be recommended um, for Schedule B, and that reflects the, um, the fact that these lands are designated for residential use, as well as the interrelationship between these lands and the property to the north. Um, there is an active draft plan of subdivision for property 31 that's in process, uh, and the lands are very interrelated. Um, a secondary access for the lands to the north is required and likely will be through um, the Activa lands, so it, it just makes sense to um, have them both be priority B. So I am in support of that recommendation of staff. Um, there's another matter that I wanted to talk about, um, and that is uh, for property 122, which is located, and I don't have a map with me, but it's located at the northeasterly intersection of Fisher Hallman Road and Bleams Road. Uh, it's summarized on page 41 of the draft KGMP as an area that requires confirmation of sanitary servicing solution, which may be dependent upon other land. Um, I just wanted to note that there is now a sanitary servicing solution uh, for this area, uh, and that we ask that the KGMP be updated to reflect this. Um, and the other thing I wanted to note is that there are a number of um, matters that are going to be happening through the fisher hallman corridor. Um, upgrades to the corridor are proposed for 2019. Um, a culvert is proposed uh, to happen between 2018 and 2020. And the Middle Strasburg trunk sanitary sewer is scheduled between 2022 and 2023. 
um, and we're requesting that the scheduling of these be revised uh, so that these works can be coordinated. Um, it's our understanding that that was always the intent that these uh, improvements be coordinated um, and the purpose of that is to minimize the environmental impacts uh, and to minimize the disruption to the community. Otherwise, you're going to do the upgrades, close the road while that's happening, open the road, and then in a couple of years close it again to do further works. Um, and it just makes sense to only close the road once and do everything um, at once. And, and I know the KGMP focuses more on DC eligible items, um, but there's a, a number of non DC eligible items that also need to be coordinated, um, the local storm sewer, water main, sanitary sewer. And uh, we just are here today to just request um, that it be given the consideration that everything be coordinated and perhaps staff can play a role in coordinating with all the property owners and the region to make sure that all of these works um, go at the same time and that the scheduling be adjusted so that um, the culvert and the MSTSS be also um, brought forward to 20, uh, 2019 when the Fisher Hallman Road improvements are scheduled. Okay, thank you. We do have a few questions for you. Councillor Fernandez? No. Councillor Etherington? No. Councillor Galloway Zelock? Yeah, my question is on your last point um, with regards to um, the servicing when Fisher Hallman Road is going to be closed for the widening. Um, I read in the report that all the piping and everything's going to be done at that time. Was that your understanding as well? So the road wouldn't have to be closed again? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. I Sorry. I don't to talk again. <laughs> when I try to force my voice more, it gets worse. Um, so the, the pipes that need to go under Fisher Hallman Road, they're being put there when the reconstruction of Fisher Hallman Road is done. Is that your understanding? So it's my understanding that there's going to be upgrades done to the road, which um, is more the surface level upgrades is my understanding, in 2019. But then the Middle Strasburg Trunk Sanitary has to go under the road, and that's scheduled to happen a few years later. So the road's going to have to be closed for both rounds of improvements. Okay. My understanding is it's going to be done at the same time, but um, I'll ask staff that question. Um, I think that was my only... Oh, oh, my other question with uh, parcel 147. You said something about it needs a road access in order to assist parcel number 31. Yes, yeah, so there's um, an active subdivision, draft plan subdivision that is in process right now. It's um, 30T16201. And they need um, a secondary access. And it's been suggested by staff that uh, I think they had suggested um, a solution, but it's the preference of staff that it be provided through the area that Activa owns. So when Activa comes forward with the draft plan, then there would be um, the secondary access. But where's that access going to go to if you can't go on the lands below it, on the lands south of it? Um, I, I don't have the map with me. I believe, and, and staff might have a better understanding, but I believe it um, would then go through to the lands um, to the west, which are also designated. But again, unfortunately, I don't have the draft plan with me. I just know that um, the Activa lands are important in terms of providing a second access. I think it's because they can loop through and out, but I'm not quite sure exactly where. Okay, thank you. We have no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Clare. Okay, uh, questions to staff. Councillor Fernandez. Yes. Um, Ms. Goss, we had a, uh, some communication earlier today about um, this Dundee North plan, and I understand the um, addendum, but I'm a little bit concerned about um, moving any of the properties 35 and 36. Uh, my understanding was that 30, 36 was moved to a priority C, uh, from a C to a B, even though there's, no, there's been no indication from the landowner that they wish to develop that land. And through the chair, that's correct. In the previous KGMP, parcel 36 was a priority C. It's being recommended as a priority B at this time to send a signal that our 
desire is to complete this community if applications are required, or if applications are submitted, sorry, um, in advance of dealing with, uh, with priority C or non-priority lands at this time. But th does that not assume that, um, or does that not put pressure on that landowner from other developers to try and sell off that piece of land, whether they want to or not? Uh, through the chair, it would not obligate the property owner to file any applications, nor would it take the place of any required studies that would need to be submitted on those lands to determine appropriate limits of development. Okay. This, um, the gray hatched area that says it's called New Dundee, or Dundee Road North, um, there's some significant sensitive sensitivity to those, those areas. They have not been given any priority as yet. Is that correct? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay. The, some of the, um, as I was reviewing some of the letters that came in um, from some of our development interest, how is that affecting the um, changes or the anticipated widening of New Dundee Road for any development that's north of New Dundee Road? Like, have we changed priorities from C to B without the full understanding of what is happening to New Dundee Road and when? Uh, through the chair, no. The priority B, again, is similar to what we had talked about with parcel 36. It's to indicate that should applications come in on those lands, that they would be worked on first, uh, rather than any priority C or no priority lands. Okay. All right, I have comments, but I'll reserve them for a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Etherington. Through you, Mr. Chair, a couple of quick questions to Ms. Goss. Uh, throughout this document, Ms. Goss, almost on every page you mention affordable housing. I see very little happening on affordable housing as everyone in the universe knows by now, um, especially along the LRT route. I wanted to ask you why we are not doing more despite the, in my opinion, foot dragging by the province on inclusionary zoning and snail's pace steps by regional government. Like, why are we not doing more? Why don't I see more happening? So through the chair, with respect to the KGMP, affordable housing isn't necessarily a focus um, of us prioritizing growth with required infrastructure. However, it is a consideration that was used when we developed the growth management strategy. I would suggest that other action items as part of the growth management strategy are being worked on from an affordable housing perspective, and some of those you have seen and approved uh, council policies with respect to <coughs> affordable housing earlier this year. Uh, another thing that you will see in, the, in uh, the coming years, as early as next spring, is some zoning regulations dealing with um, placing a priority on bonusing for affordable housing uh, in our downtown area as well as along the LRT line. So I would suggest that we are making some strides within the uh, mandate that we do have to deal with affordable housing. And we continue to work with our regional partners um, to facilitate things under their jurisdiction. And this partnership locally with the region, which seems to be the reason given for lack of affordable housing, is there going to be an improvement in that partnership, do you think, from what you said? Uh, through the chair, it's my understanding that there's ongoing conversations between us and our regional partners as, as, as early as last week. So we do continue to make strides in, in that uh, partnership. Do you have any comment on that inclusionary zoning where we insist that a certain amount of low-cost housing Councillor Edmonton, we, we are getting a way off topic here. I, I gave you the latitude to, uh, to have a few questions addressed. Can you it's on every page of the report, Mr. Chair. I'll be perfectly interested in challenging the chair if you want to well, go, go ahead. Challenge the chair, please. I had one other question. If it's pertinent to, to, the, uh, to, the, to this report, go ahead. Ms. Goss, uh, are you aware of the recent comments by Brian Doucette from the UW Planning Department where he's saying we'll have one chance in a million of 
building low-cost housing along the LRT route and encouraging it within documents like this one. If we don't do it, it may be 30 or 40 years before we have the chance again. Have you, have you seen any, any of the, those comments? Uh, through the chair, I have I've heard of those comments and regard um, vaguely recall something coming across social, me social media with respect to that. I would suggest that uh, you know our history in terms of staging and development and growth management is definitely we are a city that is positioned to deal with our growth in a managed way. We have several tools that planners do use to deal with affordable housing. And I would suggest over the next couple of years through work that um, myself and my colleagues are tabling in terms of policies, guidelines, growth management strategies, and zoning regulations that, that there will be a, a number of, of matters to help satisfy um, those, those items. Thank you for tolerating my off topic question. Brandon, you've heard this before. Yes, uh, through the chair, just to supplement uh, two quick points. So number one, uh, the reason we included it within the framework for looking at each of these growth areas is to set it up for the time when the region does provide us with concrete targets. And we wanted to get ahead of that and be ready for that so that we could look at each of our growth areas to prioritize them with one of the criteria about affordable housing provision. Uh, in advance of that, so the second point is, when you see that in the pages that evaluate each of the growth areas, you would notice that the areas that are our nodes, our corridors, the intensification areas, that they will get uh, a higher score. So the pie will be a little bit higher in that strength in communities goal because they have a higher probability or a higher potential or a higher need for achieving the affordable housing provision compared to, uh, for example, there's, there's growth areas like Dune South where it's a little bit more on home ownership and so there's a low probability. So relatively speaking, that <coughs> suburban area would have a lower score and a lower priority for development approvals for that very reason. So it does factor into the growth management plan. We just don't have concrete numbers because as you alluded to, the province or the region haven't given us the tools to do that yet. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Councillor Galloway Sealock. Yeah, I want to go back to some of the questions that I was asking the um, delegation just with regards to um, moving what will be termed um, 147 um, to a B status. And why is that crucial? Through the chair, I wouldn't suggest it's crucial. I would suggest that the amended recommendation that's before you today would provide some clarity and transparency um, to all those involved. So it would give clear direction to staff in terms of the processing of any development applications that are filed on that portion of Activa's lands in the next two years. Um, I would suggest that it's just a, a clearer interpretation of staff's intent that was written into the staff report. See, I just don't understand why that small sliver needs to be approved at this point when it probably should be a part of the macro study for Dundee North. If it's not crucial to um, parcel 31 or an access, like it's not going to provide an access to anywhere. It's in the middle of a farm field. I don't understand why it's going to be moved like from not being a priority to all of a sudden being a priority B. And so I'm just trying to understand that. So through the chair, just a couple of items uh, on that. Those lands are different than the balance of gray hatched lands in Dundee North in that they do currently have an urban land use, whereas the rest of Dundee North does not and does need to go through a comprehensive planning exercise, similar to that um, that we did for Rosenberg and that is the intent. The, these lands are a bit different in that they have been in the urban area for a while and they do have urban land uses. It is our understanding that they will functionally um, be related to parcel 31 in terms of, as Ms. St. Clair mentioned, a secondary access for 31. It's uh, staff 
anticipate that applications would be filed that would require a community plan amendment, a zone change, and a subdivision of those lands. And the applicant was asking for some certainty that those, any applications that were filed on those lands could be processed in the absence of a priority in the KGMP. Okay, it, it, I understand that you may not have the answer right now, but I think before we approve this, um, whatever Monday we have council, um, I don't know if it's next week or not, um, that we have a better understanding because to me, when I look at that parcel and understand that area, secondary access, I'm not sure what this parcel is going to do for that. And so I'd like to understand that better before we can proceed with, with this. And I don't know if that's something you can get to us, but if there's a draft um, submitted by property owner 31, um, maybe I can have a better understanding of that. Does that make sense? Through the chair, yes, I can get that additional okay. information. Also, I'd like to mention that the recommendation is a two-parter. So if there was consideration of the original recommendation with a separate consideration of the amendment, that is possible. Okay. And then my other question is with respect to um, parcel number 145. Um, was it part of the KGMP last time? Sorry, it's the, I don't have the page number, but it's the lands right at the corner of Tressler in Ottawa. So through the chair, your, uh, my understanding, let me find it here. Uh, those are the additional lands in the Renton West Phase 3B that we're talking about, parcels 145 and yes. 146. Yes. No, those were not part of the KGMP prior to this KGMP in front of you. Okay, and so how do they come onto the radar and get a, a B right away? One of my biggest concerns right now, um, especially with 145, is they clear cut every tree they had. And that's concerning to me that property owners will do that and then start selling their land to developers. How can we prevent that from happening? And maybe this isn't the exact vehicle, but they get a priority B for cutting all the trees down on their property. You know, you're, I get your planners, but these are the dilemmas we have to face when making these decisions. Through the chair, I understand your point, um, and it's a point well taken, and it is something that we struggled with internally. However, it has been identified as a parcel that has the potential to have some subdivision. It has not yet been determined what the limits of development will be on the parcel, but what has transpired between the last KGMP and this KGMP is the acknowledgement that some of the property could possibly develop through a planner subdivision and therefore it is appropriate to identify it as a future development parcel um, with required studies to be submitted as part of that subdivision application. I'm just again concerned that it's been part of no plan um, up until this point and that it gets to come on to the KGMP at uh, priority B, um, which will compete with all the other priority Bs that have been in place, some of them for a really long time. And my concern just stems from it's being looked at an area now for a subdivision because they clear cut it. Before it wouldn't have had that much space. There wasn't that much land. And now it's just a wide open field because they cut thousands of trees down. I'm assuming it's thousands, but it's in the hundreds for sure. <laughs> Through the chair, I, I completely understand the point that it's being made. Um, when we considered these lands um, in terms of the priorities and the relative priorities and the description of those relative priorities in the KGMP, there was an option for it to be a priority C or a priority B. When you look at um, that list of criteria in there, it did fit best with a priority B. However, it, it's that this decision is council's to make. Okay. Maybe we need to just talk more before we give a final approval on this uh, at council, just because I have some uh, concerns. We've got a lot now in, in B, and, and I know everyone presses for B, and I, I understand that and appreciate the, the dilemma you guys face um, every time we do one of these studies. Um, it's just certain things have transpired that uh, don't sit well 
in the last couple of years, and so um, maybe we can just talk offline more on that. And um, yeah, I think that was all my questions. Thank you. Oh, no, I had one more. Um, Go ahead. Couple, sorry. There's no one else queued in. Okay. Sorry. A lot of this affects Ward 5, so um, I apologize for taking so much time. But um, there was a couple references in there with regards to the servicing uh, for some of the here on Southlands with respect to the credit for refund um, agreement. So I'm assuming that those will be noted that I don't think it necessarily changes priority, but um, it they wanted changes, but now that that's moving forward, it kind of changes this. Is that correct? Through the chair, it's my understanding that that tender was approved by council recently um, to advance the timing of the Strasburg Road um, extension. And so, yes, that has been met. I'm waiting for confirmation that the credit refund agreement has been fully executed, and then, okay. yes, we will honor what staff recommended in the report. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have no further questions. Uh, do we have a mover? Move Councillor Fernandez moves it. All those in favor? You have comments? Okay, go ahead. You know, I'd be amiss if I didn't make comments because I have in the past about this this work. The Kitchener Growth Management Plan, I think, is critical to how our city grows. Um, we've seen a fair bit of um, OMB appeals, and our staff have had to navigate that over the last number of years, which really hampers their ability to plan our city in a responsible, respectful, and sustainable manner. As I look at some of these um, comments and, and, and the letters received you know, from, from really the same old, same old, I have to wonder if the pressure put on by the developments developers to our, our, um, our city staff is relentless and hence the reason that some of these things get put into a priority B when they could re remain easily remain to a, in a priority C. I think Councillor Galloway Seelock's comments are bang on when it comes to a situation like 145. We are in some way rewarding bad behavior. And, um, you know, we want to see our city grow and develop, but we have to be cognizant of the sustainability of that development. I hear time and time again from residents living in the Dune South area that, you know, and, and the irony is they live in an area that was one that I wasn't supportive of, but about how they can't get out of their community because New Dundee Road is a nightmare. And it's accident after accident. Um, and, and so any development that's going to be feeding onto New Dundee Road should not happen until the region has done the work on New Dundee Road. And I would hazard to guess that that probably should apply to Fisher Hallman as well. And I'm, gl I'm glad to hear that, that some of that work is going to be happening in the next couple of years. But until we get that infrastructure completed on roads that are existing, here already, then we really should not be putting pri moving priority uh, C's into B's. And when I look at this map, I, it wasn't that long ago that we had a lot more red. And I think that was okay, because that meant we were moving in a slow and systematic way in how we are, our city grew. Um, I sure hope I don't see Dundee North <laughs> changing next year into a priority B because I think that that would be a very serious um, setback for the ecological system and the environmental sustainability of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marsh. Just a quick comment that I, uh, I think that we need to perhaps look at our sustainable urban forest program development in context of the uh, some of the problems experienced um, that Councillor Gallery Seelick has raised, because that that might be uh, one approach that we can use to dissuade or discourage um, more clear cutting, uh, and perhaps we should look at even uh, 
uh, some form of a fine for uh, for clear cutting without uh, without a reason to to clear cut we need to encourage more and more uh, our uh, private as well as public lands to have uh, healthy healthy tree foliage on it Thank you, Councillor Galloway Sealock. Well, indulge me for one more second. I never got to follow up on that one question that I asked the delegation with regards to Fisher Hallman Road. Um, so, just a quick question. When the, the road work's done for Fisher Hallman by the region, I read in your comments that. Um, that the work within the right of way of the road will be completed at that time for the middle Strasbourg trunks sanitary sewer and any other pipes that need to happen so there wouldn't be a need for two road closures so through the chair what is in the staff report pertains to the middle Strasbourg trunk sanitary sewer and yes it's my understanding from engineering that the portion of that uh, trunk sewer that is uh, part of the works, uh, as part of the Fisher Holman Road widening, will occur in that timing, but only that portion. Right. My understanding from the delegation is that they are asking for a request to uh, consider advancing timing for uh, local works. Um, in that, my understanding from engineering is that there are discussions ongoing with respect to trying to align as much of that timing as possible. Okay. That's good to hear because that's going to be a major, major inconvenience but needed all at the same time. Uh, so I appreciate that answer. Um, just a quick comment. Um, I've made a, a few already, but I do appreciate staff always doing this work. I don't envy it. Um, you know, when you used to do it, we'd have a gallery full of people coming forward to um, try and sway us to go a different direction. So understanding that the majority are, are now a priority B, and that makes them a little bit happier. Um, I appreciate all the work and time that you put in to this report because it really is important for us to keep on top of and manage the growth of our city. We've got a lot of land left, but if we don't do it right, we don't get to do it again. But if we don't uh, do it right, we could be without land in a much shorter time frame than we realistically should be. And I can tell you from my experience um, that a subdivision with over 600 homes can go up within two years, three years. Uh, it doesn't take long. Um, depending on you know who the builder is, and uh, we're seeing massive growth um, in Ward Five, and we'll continue to see that. And with that respect, I've made a, a, an offhanded comment to one of my colleagues today. But with all that growth and all the yellow you see within the KGMP, you have to remember that that area also has no permanent um, facilities. We're going to change that soon, but. Just one more plug for all the facilities that we could need in the southwest end. Thank you. Councillor Etherington. For you, Mr. Chair, uh, as our city expands and develops, we have to do more to create a balance of housing for low, middle, and high income families right across the city. Um, I read recently that Amsterdam has done it. They've got a deal, they've got a policy where it's 40% for social housing, 40% for middle income, 20% for the higher income people. They managed to do it so that all comers can afford uh, to buy or rent. Even in an election year, which we're heading into, when it's politically difficult to do so, we have to do more as a council to encourage staff and encourage developers to create that kind of balance throughout the city. And I think this report and others like it is a great, uh, a great avenue to uh, do that. So I thank planners for this report. Thank you, Councillor Davey. Thank you. I yeah, wanted to echo the. I think the work is the work that went into this is evident by the number of delegations we had, which was practically zero. 
Um, uh, that's certainly not an opposition. Uh, I just wanted to touch, I know we went off topic a little bit somewhat in terms of uh, the conditions under which sometimes the priority is assigned uh, with respect to the clear cutting of trees. And I, I think it, I don't think it was anyone's intention, but unfortunately staff was put in the position of uh, defending that when I think you know the reality is, is you know our staff don't want to see this any, any more than anyone else. They have the the duty to look at each individual parcel based purely on the planning principles. They don't have the luxury of judging based on the track records of the people that own the property. I just think that's an important point to make. Okay, Councillor Fernandez, you want to add something you're saying? Yeah. Well, with the amendment that was brought forward by um, Ms. Goss. Uh, she did indicate that it would be possible to break out the two pieces. Um, and in, in light of the, the um, discussion that's happened, I'd like to do that. So um, that the first clause be voted on separately and the second clause be voted on as well. Okay. Separately. And with a recorded vote for both. Okay. And just to clarify with clerks, this is the full new rec recommendation? Okay. Um, I will make my comments. And... Uh, it's very interesting hearing the comments around the, around the horseshoe on various issues and with regards to this with our growth management plan. Um, and I think I've made this comment several times before. Um, well, when you implement stricter controls on land development, we increase costs for land development and then we slow down land development and then arbitrarily the province puts a border around our growth so we can't expand upon that we are we are where we are and unfortunately if we do not just keep moving the city forward and, and the problem with affordable housing is is never going to be solved in my mind and uh, when you have the all those together we're just looking at increased prices and I don't know how many times times again we come to this council on planning meetings and I see we fighting every 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 application when it comes to intensification something has to give here um, something needs to make sense and I think staff does a, a does a great job with uh, with the with with Councillor Davy had mentioned that it's all based on planning principles and uh, and if I can recall correctly a lot of these were I think were read last time now that was three four years ago the, 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 these have all shifted so they are are following the pattern of what of what they were before so uh, maybe there's some surprises in here I don't know but in particular wards that um, that I don't follow in full detail, but I mean, I think overall, I mean, we need to have open up some of these lands to to facilitate this growth that we have. And and uh, with that, I, it's been recalled a no, not a recall, recorded vote. Has it been called recorded vote? Recorded vote on the two items. So we're going to deal with item number one first. I don't see it. Is it on? Oh, Frank. Okay. That's carried unanimously. Item number two. I mean, paragraph number two. The polls are open. That's carried. Oh, yeah, please, those in favor, stand. Opposed? Okay. And that concludes uh, Community Infrastructure Service Committee for, for this Monday, October 30th.
2017.